smiling. I just got a text from my baby sister. She's a year younger than me. And uh, she's been in labor for 85 hours and just had a baby, her first baby. So it's very exciting. You know, I, it's, it's, an, it's another example of God's grace and goodness. Um, she had had multiple miscarriages. Um, she's 35 years old and this is her first child. And it's been a, it's been a journey. Um, and it kind of leads me into, into just this service. Um, as I was looking through the songs that I, that I wanted to do today, um, you'll notice as we, as we worship together that a lot of these songs revolve around this idea of surrender. And so often we think we have it all figured out. We know the steps, we know the, the plan and the process and, and what God has for us. And, and ultimately, what he's actually asking is that we surrender to him, uh, not just with our, our lives, but with our hearts as well. And so um, as, we, as we worship together, as we uh, give this time to the Lord, I just encourage you to just to think through that idea of surrender. Um, examine your own life and examine your own heart. Um, and if, if there are things in your life that you haven't surrendered to him, I just really encourage you and I, and I pray that the spirit would, would just pull from you uh, your pride and my pride uh, that we would surrender wholly uh, to his will.
So I want to suggest to everybody that let's take some time and ask the Spirit to come and make us humble this morning um, as we prepare to worship with Him. Uh, as we do every Sunday, we'll start with just a time that we can come before the Lord and let's spend that time asking for humility from God for us today. And then uh, I'll pray and then we will have confession together. Lord God, we just come and fall before you. Lord, we, we bow in reverence to you as the creator. And we thank you, Lord, that you've loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And that you showed your power over this world, over Satan and over death by raising him from the dead. And Father, we just rejoice that he now sits at your right hand. God, we ask that you would come Humble us all today that we can confess our sins so we can come before you with pure hearts, Lord. We just pray that you'll hear our songs of worship that will be pleasing to you and that you will hear our confession and that you will have mercy on us in it. Just pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Confess with me. Almighty God. Eternal Father, we acknowledge and confess to you that we were born in unrighteousness. Our life is full of sin and transgression. We have not gladly believed your word nor followed your holy commandments. For your goodness sake and for your name's sake, be gracious to us, we pray. Thank you that you have forgiven us all our sin, which is very great. Through the work of Christ on the cross, amen. Let's just sing that uh, chorus again. Give us clean hands. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to none. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to none. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say.
Psalm 25. <clears throat> to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. <clears throat> my eyes are ever toward the Lord, and he will pluck my feet out of the net. <clears throat> Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. And guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. God, we surrender to you this morning. God, we give you the things that we've held so tightly. Father, you know all of our days. You know everything that has happened and will happen. And God, this morning, we as a church, God, turn our eyes to you. May we not lift our souls to idols. But God, may we bow before you in humility. 
bow before you in gratitude. Father, this morning I pray that you would soften our hearts. Lord, that if anyone in this room does not know you, God, that you would draw them to yourself. God, anyone in this room who is holding on, holding on to sin, God, holding on to, to dreams and to wishes and making those things our idols, God, I pray that you would rip those things from us this morning. God, draw each one of us to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stay standing for a minute. Good morning, Cap City Church. Good morning. I'm reminded of a Eugene Peterson quote. He said, Church is the colony of heaven in the country of death. Not talking about America, but the world. This is our opportunity to experience a little taste of what eternity is going to be about. So if this feels different, even for those of us who maybe have been in the faith a long time, it can almost be shocking when we come together and we're reminded of being still before God and seeking holiness and seeking to surrender. It's so countercultural, not to America, but to humanity. Just remember, this is a colony of heaven in a country of death. So we're gonna read Psalm 51 together. We are gonna read the entire thing, so thanks for hanging in there with me. Psalm 51, out of the English Standard Version of the Bible, to the choir master, a Psalm of David. Here's our context, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Verse one, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Verse 12, what a powerful prayer that we could all pray. Restore the joy that I experienced from your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. My tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. Fear is a very powerful motivator. If we're afraid, if we're anxious, and often it can be triggered by something that we don't even realize, we don't even understand what's happening, Uh, I'm not particularly a fearful person, at least I don't think I am. I don't seem to struggle with anxiety, although maybe I do. Uh, I I just don't seem to be flustered by a lot of things, which is the reason why when something like what I'm about to share with you happens, it sticks with me. And I still remember this story from so many years ago 
It was when my wife and I were still living in Florida and we had gone up to Savannah to spend a weekend. Uh, we uh, used to do that a lot, believe it or not, just get away. Uh, I don't even remember, I, I, I think the kids maybe were really young. Uh, I remember we went to Savannah, it was about a five to six hour drive for us and we loved to go there, we loved to hang out, it's a beautiful place to visit. And we had booked at this old historic inn and we were gonna be staying there for the weekend and we got there late at night. I don't remember why, we must have left after work, but we got there late at night and I'll never forget, now they had told us that this inn was haunted, right? So if you've ever been to Savannah, every building in Savannah is haunted and they have a story to tell you. And by the way, they're selling you something along the way. We didn't care, it was a beautiful place. So it turns out there's this one room up there. That's the room. I don't remember what happened. Somebody hung themselves or there was a cannonball that went through the wall and hits. I, who knows? It's probably different every weekend. But anyway, here we are. We get there late at night. We check in. They give us the keys. They say drive around to the side. Uh, and to be honest with you, if you've ever been there at night, it can be a little creepy, right? So we drive around the side of the building and we park. <laughs> I'll never forget this. We weren't staying in the room that was supposedly haunted, but it was in that general bank of windows. And we, we pull the car around to the side of the building and uh, I start unloading our stuff. And you've ever, have you ever seen something out of the corner of your eye and your brain immediately registers it and reacts to it before consciously you've done anything? Anybody in here ever done anything like that? Okay, four of us, good. <laughs> I did it. That's how our mind works. That's how our body works. That's how our brain works. And uh, I was so tired and I was so ready for bed, which possibly is what contributed to it. But there was somebody in the window looking down at us. And my brain immediately triggered because I was ready for bed until that happened. <laughs> then I was not ready for bed. And my brain gets a little confused because it's fight or flight, right? And my brain can't decide which are we doing. Like, am I punching somebody or am I running? Here's my wife, I gotta take care of her. All of that happens in a split second. It's just this powerful reflex. My heart rate went up. Well, come to find out, because that's the area that's haunted, they had dressed up a mannequin. God bless them and stuck it behind the curtain looking out the window. And it turns out that when it's almost midnight and you're tired and you glance up, it looks like an actual person's looking at you. Isn't that silly? But isn't it crazy how often fear can grab hold of us and run away with it? It can run away with an experience that we've had. Fear is powerful. I'm telling you a story that happened more than a decade ago. And it's still visceral. I still remember it because it was such a reflex thing. It wasn't a conscious decision, it just happened. Fear is very powerful. Fear is also primal. It's just something that happens to us. When we have fear, we have this unconscious reflex that can involve denial and we don't really realize that we're doing it or understand why. It can involve frustration. It can involve anger. If I could just talk to the men for a second. Have you figured out, men, that most of the emotions that we experience come out as anger? If we're scared, we get angry. And if we're frustrated, we get angry. And if we're tired, we get angry. And that's another sermon for another day. Fear is powerful and fear is primal. And so with that as a context, I want you for just a second, whether you, whether you believe what we believe or not, whether you're not sure about the Bible or maybe you've been a believer a lot longer than I've been alive. What unites us all is that we're sitting in this room together and you have to listen to me talk for the next few minutes. So for just a few minutes with that fear, that idea of fear being powerful and primal, I want you to use that as a backdrop to think about you, how you and I approach the idea of sin and not somebody else's sin but our sin. How do you approach the idea of your sin? How do I approach the idea of my sin? Because the truth is anger and frustration and denial and minimizing for many of us, that could summarize the way we often react. And I would include myself in that. It can summarize the way we will often react 
to our own sin. And what we don't realize is it's being driven by something. Most often, it's fear. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to admit that we have sin. This is the conundrum. Are you ready? Listen, this is the paradox. Because you and I have what the Bible calls indwelling sin. This is a theological idea. We have indwelling sin. All of us, every single one of us. If your name's not Jesus, you have indwelling sin. And because we have indwelling sin, we also have an aversion to admit that we're sinners. You feel how there's a little circular argument going there? Because we're sinners, we don't want to admit that we're sinners, but we actually need to admit it more and more and more. And so a psalm like this one kind of smacks us in the face. Because that's what the whole thing's about, is how sinful the writer was, how sinful King David was. So there are these two big ideas. We talk about this often as a church. This is really repetition for the purpose of being a reminder for you. This is in your notes, so I want you to write this down. If you're taking notes, I want you to hang in there with me. The gospel is where deep spiritual need meets abundant grace. The gospel is not just the starting line for you to become a believer. It's not just something that we use for evangelism to explain what it means to be a Christian, to be a believer to those who don't understand God. The gospel is not something that you outgrow or put away. For each of us, every day, the gospel is where deep spiritual need meets abundant grace. Either of those things, if you minimize them, you are minimizing the gospel. By the nature of what we're talking about, if you want to dive to the depths of the gospel, you have to deepen your understanding of your spiritual need which then allows you to springboard, we're going to talk about this in just a second, springboard into the idea that it's not just your spiritual need that's deep, it's also God's abundant grace that is deep. Deep spiritual need and abundant grace. Well, so this is the second phrase that we use often, the second sentence that we say often. The beginning of the gospel is that something is wrong with us. And when we say that, what we mean is quite literally that for you and I, We need to constantly be reminded that the gospel is not something that we believe and we do. The gospel is something that we believe and we cooperate with what God is already doing in us. We're cooperating with the work that God is doing, but the work is based on the idea, we start with the idea that there's something wrong with me. Listen to me. For every day as a believer that you and I wake up And we believe, maybe in a primal way, maybe in the back of our minds, maybe it's not conscious, in the back of our minds every day that we wake up and believe that, you know what, I've pretty much got this together. And I am self-sufficient, and I'm going to go accomplish a lot of things for God today. God bless you. (laughs) And I appreciate your heart that maybe you want to go accomplish a lot of things for God today. But it always starts with the idea that I'm a sinner. It starts with that idea. And I'm telling you, whether it's every morning when you wake up and you make your cup of coffee or tea or whatever it is that you're making and you read your Bible, see how optimistic I am? Every morning you're waking up and reading your Bible, whether it's that, whether it's Eric leading us in worship and we're confessing through song, anytime you and I put our, have the courage to put ourselves out there that we're sinners... We are simultaneously making ourselves vulnerable, but also setting ourselves up to experience God's grace in all of its fullness. Listen, it's a package deal. You don't get one without the other. You don't get deep, abiding grace given to someone who doesn't really need it. Because I've got it figured out, God. Yeah, no, God, I used to be a sinner, but you know, I've been a believer for 20 years now. Oh boy, could I just barge into the middle of your mind at the moment? You're still a sinner. You're still in need, deep need of God's grace every single day. A full acknowledgement of our sin is simultaneously what we need the most, listen, and what we hate the most. And it's that primal reaction of fear 
No, I may not consciously decide, but I'm generally going to move away from that. Can I just invite you to find the courage to dive headlong into it? Simultaneously, we need it the most and we hate it the most. And so Christianity is quite literally a perspective shift. This is what discipleship is, where we begin to see God, ourselves, and the world as they really are, rather than the way that we think that they are. We're shifting. We're shifting our focus. We're shifting our perspective. Real spiritual growth, this is a quote from J.I. Packer, it's a fantastic quote. Real spiritual growth is always growth downward, so to speak, into profounder, what's the word? Come on, say it. It doesn't say into profounder self-sufficiency. No, that's not what spiritual growth is. As we grow spiritually, we simultaneously, hopefully, will sin less, but we also become more aware of the sin that's already there. So yes, we want to grow in sanctification, which is this great big theological word, which means progressive holiness. We're growing in holiness. We're growing in our, in our closeness to who God is and what God's called us to be and who God's called us to be in his love, in his grace. And yet we become more and more aware that things are a lot more rotten in our souls than we may have first realized. Which then sets us up to be more and more thankful. For God. So, so God, you knew that about me all along? I'm telling you, after almost 30 years of being a believer, I am more amazed today that God would have saved me than I've ever been. Because I see more and more junk in my soul and I go, God... You were aware of all this? <laughs> hey, God, you really got the raw end of the deal here. He <clears throat> really did. So the context for this, according to the subtitle of Psalm 51, the context is the story of David and Bathsheba. We don't have a ton of time to unpack that. Many of you are familiar with the story. You've heard the story before. David was the king. And he was, he had a wife and he should have been there. The army was out in the field and he should have been with them. And he wasn't, he was in the palace instead of, you know, fulfilling his role as the commander of the army. And one night he's walking around on his, the rooftop of his palace. And obviously that's the highest building in the land, right? And he looks down and he sees something that he should not see. He sees a woman bathing. She's on her rooftop in privacy. This is all on him. It's 100% on him. He sees it because he's the king. He arranges then for an adulterous interaction. Uh, she becomes pregnant. He finds out uh, her husband was one of the commanders in the army. So David calls him back, which we think of David and Bathsheba as primarily a story about adultery, which it is. But it's also a story about murder. Don't forget about that. He doubles down on his sin and he arranges for her husband to be put at the front of the lines because he knows that he will be killed. This is pretty dark. This is pretty dark. And it's easy for you and I in temptation to say, how dare he? Well, that's technically true. But our posture needs to be what part of my soul is reflected in this story? Where are, the, where are the dangers and the temptations of this story playing out in my experience, in my heart, in the way that I live my life? And eventually he's confronted by the prophet Nathan, who stands up and says to him something that nobody else had the guts to say. You're guilty before God and you need to repent. And so Psalm 51, historically the Jewish people believe that that was the context that David wrote this psalm in. It was interesting to watch Isaac get up here a few minutes ago and read that scripture and just be choked up. Shouldn't we be? Shouldn't we just slow down and let it breathe and realize that this is not something that we should take for granted? So David writes Psalm 51 as this response to this rebuke that he had received. First of all, who has the guts to rebuke the king? By the way, it's not the president. It's the king. 
He can have you put to death, really, on a whim. And he's rebuked and he responds. So we don't have time to read every verse, but I want to point out five big ideas from this psalm. We're going to run rather fast through this, so keep it handy there. Uh, The idea number one is that a proper understanding of sin provides a context for grace. These are verses one and two. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Now here, listen, here's what we're talking about. What you're finding is mercy in the context of sin Love in the context of sin. These are two really big ideas, but as you deepen one, it makes you realize how deep the other is. Proper understanding of sin provides a context for grace. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Please hear me. The idea is that you and I are probably a lot worse off than we think. About five or six years ago, my wife uh, broke her ankle. She was doing one of these mud run things. I don't know if you've seen those. You run through, I don't, I, I wasn't with her. So. <laughs> you run through mud, I guess, and there's obstacles. And there's, she, it was just a very freak thing. She was doing it and she literally, she stepped wrong. And suddenly she couldn't stand up anymore. She looked fine. She looked fine. And maybe we were tempted to say, well, just, you know, walk it off. What turns out, uh, she broke her fibula. It was really bad. She wound up having to have surgery and plates and screws, which are still in there. She's a bionic woman now. But on the surface, it didn't look that bad. And I remember thinking to myself, because suddenly the doctor's talking to us, not just about surgery, but about because she broke her right foot, she can't drive. For six weeks, she can't drive. And I'm going, you don't know how busy we are. So now I'm a chauffeur and we've got kids and there's school and she's a principal. What what in the world are, are we doing here? No, no, no. It looks fine. The problem was much deeper than the way that it looked. Lean into that. Listen. It's easier to smooth it over because on the surface it looks fine. It's easy to be in denial. But when you start taking x-rays of your heart and doing MRIs on your soul... You realize that the problem's a lot deeper than you and I might have admitted initially. Do not minimize the depth of your sin. Here's what I want to say to you. I want you to look at me. And you may never come back to Cap City Church, but I'm going to say this to you anyway because this is a really uncomfortable idea, but it is the idea that this church is built on. Listen, acknowledging our sin is painful. It's uncomfortable. It sets the context to understand God's grace for what it really is. That's why we do it. We're not into self-loathing. We just want to be real before God. But we have to be purposeful about intentionally acknowledging this because our reflex, like mine was in Savannah, our reflex is to say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So we're going to intentionally be a church that does this Together, we're not going to minimize the depth of our sin because, listen, repentance is inexorably tied to grief. If you're doing repentance right, there will be an element of grief involved with it. We don't have to live there, but we have to start there. Y'all look at me. The beauty of the gospel is that you don't have to live there. But if you're going to understand the gospel, you have to start there. We start with sin. We start with the fact that we are sinners. We minimize the power and majesty of God's forgiveness because we accidentally, or maybe sometimes purposefully, minimize our need for it. Which is then what makes us say God's forgiveness really isn't that big of a deal because I'm not really that big of a sinner. So I go home and read Psalm 51 again and have the courage to ask God, is this me? Where is this reflected in my heart? Where is this reflected in my soul? Second thing, a proper understanding of sin, this is in your notes, a proper understanding of sin means owning it. 
You see this in verses 3 through 6. We're not going to read all the verses. We have to own our sin. It's not just, listen, these two things go together. Part one was kind of the depth of our sin, right? The, the depth of our sin. Part two is the fact that it's our sin. It's my sin. It is deep and it is mine. I'm responsible for it. Don't minimize who is responsible for your sin. Look at verse 3. David says, for I know my transgressions. I know them. I have experienced them. I have thought about them, even though it's painful and it's a little embarrassing. And I'd really th rather think about something else. I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Y'all look at me. Could I ask you a question? Whose sin is ever before you? Is it primarily someone else's? Is it primarily your spouse's? Is it primarily somebody that you're frustrated with? Whose sin is ever before us? The easier question is whose sin should be ever before us? We should all primarily be looking in the mirror. Number three, sin is never the final word for the believer. This is really good news. Sin is never the final word for the believer. See, listen, the reason you and I are primarily motivated by a fear to understand and explore the depths of our sin and the depths of our guilt, the reason we're, we're, we're motivated by fear, the reason we're afraid of that is because we don't want to live there. You don't have to live there. It's beautiful. Sin's never the final word for the believer. In fact, I would say this, your loyalty to the cross means that your sin should never get the last word. If you are a believer, your loyalty to the cross, your loyalty to the work of the cross, your loyalty to the depths of what God accomplished for you on the cross mandates, it dictates that we don't get to live and stay and wallow in our own sin. We immediately, not necessarily by our own design, we are catapulted into grace. Sin sets the stage, but we don't live there. The work of the cross catapults us. And if you can think about the idea of a catapult, all you did was God put you on it. You didn't pull the lever. You didn't. You, uh, catapult's a very involuntary thing, isn't it? You didn't look for it. You didn't ask for it. God catapults you into his grace. Sin is never the final word for the believer. In verse 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be what? Yeah, there you go. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be what? Come on, look at me. Do you really believe that you're whiter than snow? How crazy is that idea? Well, if you spent the right amount of time remembering your sin, you realize that you and I couldn't come up with this on our best day. What kind of God must we be serving? Who would do this? What an incredible idea. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I'm coming to you, God, because you are the solution. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. The church that I pastored in Florida, we used to say this a lot. The message of the gospel is that no one has to be defined by their worst moment. No one has to be defined by their worst moment. Come on. You know what your worst moment is. It's exactly the thing that you've tried to not think about while I've been talking. It's that night. It's that weekend. It's that season. It's that semester. It's that relationship. You wish you hadn't taken that job. You wish you had never visited that website. You wish you had never placed that call or gone on that date. And in the back of our, our minds, we think that it defines us. The message of the gospel is that we don't have to be defined by our worst moment. We are now defined not just by the cross, 
but by how much the cross proves our Father's love for us. And our inherent value, even though if you run the numbers and look at the spreadsheet, it doesn't look like we have any value. We have value because our creator decided that we have value. Because every human's made in the image of God. We have inherent value. We don't have to be defined by our worst moment. I love this. We're going to do this again in the benediction. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, What an incredible thing to write at the end of, and and talk about being productive in ministry. I mean, if you had Paul's ministry career, what would you think as you were reflecting back? This is what he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, listen, because he judged me faithful. I didn't say that I was faithful, that I earned, I proved myself faithful. No, God decided that I was faithful. He judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a what? Formerly I was, I I raised my fist in enmity against God, formerly. And God said, I can use him. Formerly I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, what does it say? And an, hey, y'all look at me. There's a lot of insolent opponents in the room, aren't there? We were all formerly, some of us still are, but many of us can say formerly, we were insolent opponents. We were actively working against what God was up to. Here we go, that's not the end of the story. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and I want you to say these words with me, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me. Say it one more time. The grace of our Lord overflowed. Listen, if we could conceptually just get a big container and start loading your sins in it. Let's talk about every sin that you've committed. Let's start with every sin that you've committed since you woke up this morning. Since you walked in the door and let's work our way backwards all the way back to the day that you were born. That'd be a pretty big container, wouldn't it? Do you really believe that the grace of our Lord is not only enough to cover your sin, but to fill it up, to fill up that whole container to what? Overflowing. You know what that means? There's more than enough. There's more than enough. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. What a testimony. Number four, forgiveness of sin always fuels a response. Forgiveness of sin always fuels a response. At Cap City Church, we say that our goal is to help people love Jesus and live for him every day. We want you to do both of those things, but we want you to start with loving Jesus and understanding how much Jesus loves you and responding to that. And if you're going to be obedient, if you're going to grow as a disciple, if you're going to respond to something God's calling you to do, which we are going to encourage you to do, if you're going to do that, we want it to always be based in God's love for you and your love for him. Forgiveness of sin always fuels a response. It is natural. In verse 13, David says, I will teach transgressors your ways. These are his responses to God's love, God's forgiveness, God's grace. Verse 13, I will teach transgressors your ways. Verse 14, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Number 15, verse 15, my mouth will declare your praise. There's a response. There's a response. And hear this, listen. A valuable gift should not inspire us to have a cheap response. This is not about guilt. But if our response is cheap... We probably need to revisit how valuable the gift is. And don't rush past it. We need to come back to this idea, come back to this idea. In 2 Samuel, you have the, the, the story of David, and they have the ark, and they're going to sacrifice, and the ark's in this dude's barn, right? And they're gonna, we're going we're gonna to worship right here. And of course, I mean, he's the king, and the landowner says, you can ha- here, have it all, take it. This is David's response, 2 Samuel 24, 24. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me what? 
It's not a sacrifice if it's cheap. Look at me. This is the reason that we're going to call you not just to be involved, but to call you to do things that require you to sacrifice something. It's the way of God. It's the way that Christianity has operated for 2,000 years. And common sense and maybe some well-meaning people in your life, listen, will say to you, listen, I know that you're excited about the God thing. I know you're excited about the Jesus thing. But don't lose your wits. Don't go too far. Could I say to you, please lose your wits. Please go too far. This has been the response of believers for years and years. Number five, and we're finished. A widespread confession of sin can bring revival. These are the last two verses, verses 18 and 19. A widespread confession of sin can actually bring revival. Obviously, for 17 verses, it's been pretty deep. And King David has been pretty open and pretty transparent about the fact that he's a sinner. Turns out he didn't get canceled. That's interesting, right? He didn't get canceled. He was forgiven. He was restored. Verse 18 This is the result of this confession of sin. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. He's not just talking about himself anymore. He's not just talking about himself. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Why? Verse 19. Then you will delight in right sacrifice. It's not that God doesn't want your sacrifice. He wants your heart first. And he wants you to offer sacrifices that mean something that come from a heart of purity. That's the whole point. It's the point that David's trying to make. It's not just that he delights in sacrifices and you and I going through the motions. He wants our heart to be the beginning of it all. You will delight in right sacrifices and burn offerings and whole burn offerings. Listen, then bulls will be offered on your altar. When we begin to corporately, because we're doing it as individuals, acknowledge our sin, we have positioned ourselves. For God to pour out his abundant grace in new and overflowing ways. Not that he wasn't already doing it. We just weren't aware of it. Because we hadn't taken the time to understand our own sin. As our worship becomes more God honoring, it will become more meaningful to us. Listen. Just... Think with me for a second. This is not exactly the most conducive environment to experiencing God. Are y'all hot? I'm hot. And I can't always see the screens. And it's not the easiest thing to park on the back 40 and walk all the way in. And there are a bunch of people that showed up at 7 a.m. this morning and set all this up. And there are a bunch more people when we get finished are going to stay and tear it down. This is not the most conducive thing, especially for Americans who like to sit in air conditioning and do this, right? How are so many people experiencing God? Because it's not just about the environment. It's about our hearts before Him. And the foundation of it all is you and I having the courage, or more accurately, begging God for the courage to admit that we're sinners. Paul Tripp said this, I love this quote. You've heard me use this quote before. You're going to keep hearing me use this quote because I think it's powerful. Corporate worship thrives at the intersection of grief over sin and celebration over the forgiving and transforming power of God's grace. Corporate worship thrives at the intersection of two things. Grief over our sin and celebration of God's grace. What an incredible idea. So yeah, as we grieve over our sin and dive headlong into the grace of God, which allows us to be forgiven and to be freed from our sin, you bet we're going to worship. You bet we're going to sing loud. And it doesn't matter what obstacle's in front of us. If we keep our eyes on that, we're just going to keep worshiping, keep worshiping, keep worshiping. 
So what's the application? We have to have the courage to have a deepening understanding of our sin. A deepening knowledge of where our sin meets a growing appreciation for the cross and for God's grace. This is why Paul said in Galatians, Galatians was the first book that we preached through almost two years ago now. Such a powerful idea of understanding God's grace and diving into God's grace. In verse 6 of chapter 1, Galatians, Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in, what does it say? In what? The grace of Christ, and you are instead turning to what? Well, yeah, it's up there. A different, I, I'm doing most of the work, come on. I'm hot too. Stay with me. I'm astonished that you're turning from the grace of God to what? A different gospel. And I would never do that. I've got right theology. Really? When we begin to distance ourselves from our sin, I don't want to think about that anymore. I want to celebrate my wins. Okay, well, you can do that too. But the beginning of the gospel... It's not how much less of a sinner you are today than, how, than what you used to be. The beginning of the gospel is a, an, an understanding of the idea that we are sinners. And we're desperately in need of God's grace. And spiritual growth, look at me, listen to me. Because this is the philosophy of discipleship at Capital City Church. Spiritual growth is not about you knowing more scripture, being able to quote more scripture, doing more things, volunteering more hours. We love all of that and we hope all of that's true for you. But that's not the core of discipleship. The core of discipleship here is that you have a growing understanding of the depth of your own sin and the response of now I really understand how deep God's grace for me is. I had no idea God loved me that much. Paul says this again in Galatians 3. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Listen, you've been sold a bill of goods. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was public, publicly portrayed as crucified. In other words, listen, you know the story. You know the story. It ends with God's grace, but it has to start with your helplessness. That's, that wasn't just a one-time thing. That's an everyday lather, rinse, repeat. It starts with our helplessness. Let me ask you only this. This is so good. This is what we're closing with. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? How did you come into faith? Are you so foolish? <laughs> Ask the question. Don't assume you know the answer. Have the courage to ask the question. I've been asking myself this question all week, so welcome to the club. It's not easy. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Of course the answer is no. No, because that's not how it works. It's understanding my sin, understanding God's grace, living in light of the fact that that's true. And so as he calls me to step out of my comfort zone and do more and sacrifice more, I say, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? In fact, God, I want to. I want to. I want to do that for someone who's done so much for me. So here's a question I want to ask you, and we're going to pray. What sin do you need to confess? Listen, primarily to yourself. I don't need you to come confess it to me <laughs> unless you think you need to. I'm not your priest. But I want you to hear this. Part of the reason we don't like to confess our sins to each other is because we haven't yet confessed it to ourselves. We haven't yet acknowledged it for what it is. What sin do you need to grieve? What sin do you need to stop making excuses for? Listen, I don't want to leave you in your sin. That's not the goal. We want to circle back always and talk about grace. We want to circle back always and realize that God knew what you and I are just discovering, the depth of this sin, God already knew it. And he still sent his son for you. 
And that is an idea that if it gets into our soul, will compel us to follow Christ. Let's pray. Thanks, God, for your goodness and for your grace. We deserve exactly none of what you've done for us. You did it anyway. Help us to live in light of not just an acknowledgement and a deepening understanding of the depths of our sin, but God, simultaneously with that, in tandem, joined at the hip with that. The idea is not just that we're deep sinners, but that your mercy and grace really do overflow for us. Help us to live in the light of that truth in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you for coming. As I warned you earlier, our benediction this week was that passage from 1 Timothy that we read. Kind of reworded it so that you and I can personalize it. I would have you I'd, I'd, I'd challenge you to have the courage to ask, is this, how much of this is true for us? This week, may you live with a spirit of thankfulness to him who has given you strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged you faithful and he appointed you to his service. Here's the part. Even though you may have been formerly a blasphemer, or a persecutor, or an insolent opponent. May you live in awareness of and be motivated by the fact that you received mercy because you had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for you with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And may he continue his great work of creating a clean heart and renewing a right spirit with you. We're going to sing together and then you're dismissed. Sing us out. Oh.